Hey guys, welcome back to the Alpharetta's podcast, official podcast of Digital and Creative Media Works, the late night edition. <sighs> my name is David DC, I'm creative director, Lee Ryder, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Ben. Hi. Jazz fingers. Is that a thing, jazz fingers, or I made, jazz, have I made jazz that hands. up? Jazz hands are things. Or like, like jazz fingers? Pistol fingers. Also, we're joined by Laura, special guest. Yeah, hi, Laura. Hi. And we just saw Guardians of the Galaxy numero two, volume two, the yep. second Guardians of the Galaxy. The uh, second Guardians in the of sky the universe, galaxy. in space, space and about, Guardians Chris Pratt of the Galaxy 2. Sure. And Minnesota. Sorry? And Minnesota. In what way? The, his dad so, was from Minnesota. Ah. Okay, so yeah. first of all, we Ben and I tried not to talk about it in the car, and we were like trying not to ignore you talking about it in the car. Yeah. So give us your thoughts because you were eager. You you had uh, some stuff on top. Geez. Okay. Um, and now I've put you on the spot, haven't I? Yeah. <laughs> no, let, let, give me give me a minute. Um. So I liked it. I mean. Yeah, I feel from, like we all came out of that really like, yeah, positive. It was good, the, yeah. yeah, it was it was fun. I, it was good. Uh, um, some some of us some some people cried at the end. Not me, but some people. Oh uh, uh, really? I really there. The hot, yeah. Also, like, as always, spoilers for the film. Um, uh, yeah, I I don't know. Something about the the way that it wasn't. They didn't try and make it too sad. That was what got me. Is they would just they just yeah. made it like genuine and it kept progr- and then things kept happening and then I was like oh, I'm getting sadder. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Well, like the the biggest thing was like um, the one sort of thing like towards the middle was like they kept sort of interrupting tension with funny moments where it's like yeah. Whereas the first one they were sort of. They felt like they were part of the moment, whereas there was a few moments like, yeah. Particularly towards the middle with the, where Baby Groot's trying to get the little, uh, the, the fin um, from uh, the Ah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh, he's like walking through all these dudes. It's kind of, there's, there's a bit of tension there. And, and then, then it just... literally it cuts to him bringing them the wrong thing and then yeah, and it they w- do the joke about six times. And I, I thought, it, I thought that, was a, that was a good way of dealing with that trope, right? Because what you have, it, it's like the classic prison trope, right? Where it's like two people are in the prison and one person's got to bust them out. It's like the Captain Jack Sparrow, Will Turner scene. I'm well, only no, thinking about Pirates because we're just talking about. trope of the dog. Yeah, the well, that's what I'm and saying. The so, and, you know, you know, in that and scene where, to, like, you try to get the dog. It's to that exact the joke in yeah. the first Pirates film where they're in the where Will's in the prison. He's trying to get the dog to get yeah. the thing, and then Jack walks down and takes the keys from the dog. Yeah. Um. It's that exact trope, except they're both in the prison, and you've got Baby Groot, who is a bit of an idiot. Ah, uh, you know what? I didn't get sick of it, but there were f- like I didn't get sick of him as a character, but there were a few moments where I got annoyed at James Gunn for repeatedly reminding us that he was like a baby. Right. Like there would have been some scenes that I think would have been served better. So particularly when he's running the bomb inside and he's getting crushed, that was like I was like I was I was real upset by that. Oh yeah, yeah that, was, getting crushed. that was a bit rude. And Just when he was baby when he was Groot crying, I was like. Yeah. I thought that was when I was like, ah, oh, that's kind of, it just reminded me that he was a baby. What would have been better is he was just getting crushed and anxious or whatever. And uh, I thought that detracted from the fact that when he was bullied, he cried and when he was upset. Whereas I thought the fact that, you know, when he was getting crushed, I thought that detracted from the earlier scene because right. it kind of, I don't know, like the, the importance for Groot of the bullying is, is far more significant than physical pain because he knows that he'll, you know, he's, he's a tree person. He's going to be fine. Like he's aware of himself, yeah. whereas I thought the bullying was was really compelling because it was emotional torment as well as physical. And I don't know, I just when he was getting crushed, it was like ah, oh, it's sad. But like they went straight for the oh, it's a child getting hurt sadness instead of mm. oh, the guardians of you know. It, I don't know, just yeah. thought it pulled focus a bit. And no one in the cinema awed because it was the wrong time for that. Yeah, and that was there was a few moments like that. And I think it's what you were saying with like the comedic the comedic stuff. It just. Yeah. There was a few moments where I was like, ah, they kind of could have, you know, because the film, this one is much more earnest than the first one, I think. Yeah. Um, really? Well, I, thought, I, mean, I don't think it is at all. <laughs> I thought from a, from a narrative perspective, it's a lot more earnest. Like the first one is. Sure. The first one is like. The first one is like. You got a bunch of ragtag. Tesseracts. Yeah. They keep trying to steal it and then like yeah. sell it to people. You and got, then. You got, yeah. You got a ragtag bunch of thieves who got to come together to help save the universe from an insane dude with a hammer. And then they solve it by dancing. Like the first film is like quite, it's, you know, it's got a lot of levity. Whereas this one, it felt like they took that, which I really enjoyed. And they were like, okay, well, how do we do this in a way that's going to make sense? And well, I thought I mean, it was the perfect sequel the for entire, that. The entire, the entire like 
kickstart for this film was just the fact that Rocket stole some fucking batteries. Yeah, and that's great. Well, yeah. That's, that's, the inciting I, mean, I don't that's... think that's uh, I I don't think that's earnest though. I think that's the complete opposite. Uh, no, I think no, that's no. complete okay. ridiculous. Well, you're talking about plot points. I mean the narrative itself, right? Like the narrative is is a maturation plot where it's Right. It's Peter where Quill. Where it's like oh they they're not really working together and there's this tension between Rocket Raccoon. Well, it's 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 a maturation plot for Rocket for Gamora and for Peter. No one else changes yeah. in that film. The yeah. only person well, who kind Nebula. of does well, Nebula, but that's that's yeah, that's that's nah, a that's that's still... a re- that's a redemption plot though. Yeah, true. Rather than a, a same same with Yondu. So Yondu and uh, <coughs> so what was her name? Karen Gillian's character. Nebula. 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 They both have redemption arcs, whereas the other three characters sort of have maturation plots where they go from a state of naivete. So in Peter Quill's case, it's sort of impressive you know, how much character development they managed fuck, to. I mean, cram into this. It's, film. There's a lot of heavy lifting with, and then you look at. What's oh, Drax? You look at the heavy lifting yeah. of oh, Drax God. and the love plot that they execute with that, and the the way that they do that kind of ah, oh, j- like so much work went into making these characters move, and yeah. it, I I was so good. Drax laughed like twenty times in this. He film. laughed a lot, <laughs> and it's oh, I, I I started noticing it where so many characters will just start laughing. See, that was one of the one of the actual jokes that really fell quite well was the one where Drax is just losing it, and then she touches him and goes. And just loses it as well. That was funny because Drax laughing isn't inherently funny, but the minute that someone else is on the same... Because we never see anyone else laugh with Drax. Yeah. yeah. That time... I fucking lost. I was like, oh, that's a good <laughs> joke. That's a great joke to start your second film with. Yeah. It's fucking awesome. And the... Oh, okay, okay, can we talk about the, how the ending CGI battle wasn't an ending CGI battle? I've never been happier with Marvel. Do you know how in every Marvel film... There's a massive CGI climax where one big thing hits another big thing and then a city gets nearly destroyed <clears throat> and then there's a big CGI like fisticuffs in some sure. way so like thor to the th- the thor the darkening yeah there really wasn't much thor of a second. fight in this the the only thing well, you get, i mean peter quill kind of goes super for the giant for a bit. pac-man but they literally well that that, that was, was ridiculous just, but that was that very was guardians funny, yeah. yeah but like they punched on for a bit but it wasn't it wasn't like i've got to defeat him to save the day it was i'm distracting him so that other things can happen yeah, yeah. whereas like it feels like every other marvel film like you look at like the end of um you got to punch the thing to save the day yeah. yeah and you've got you've got to have the big cgi for like you know ghostbusters you've got to stop all the things and then you've got to take down um chris uh, chris evans with your guns and chris then that'll evans. save the day no, Chris, you mean Chris Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth. I picked wrong a different. Chris. I didn't say Chris Pratt. It's the wrong Chris. I don't know. The, I don't know what my Chris is from my Chris's. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wait, what? Who is it in? Chris Hemsworth. What did Hemsworth. I say the first time? You Evans. said Chris Evans. Which one's Chris Evans? Oh, he's Iron Man. No, he's Captain America. <laughs> I know my superheroes. Yeah, that's, that's Chris Downey Jr. Oh, that is Chris Downey Jr. You're yeah. right. Um, no, I fuck. Last week I forgot the names of the Star Wars films, so I'm on a roll at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know oh, what is it like? Return of the okay, okay. Return of the Sith. I think I said yeah, re- yeah. No, it was Revenge, Revenge of the, of the Jedi. Revenge of the, I don't know. What? Don't know. Yeah, I had that a was moment. Funny. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I thought that the way that they took the assets that they had, and they were like, how do we actually do this this ending climax without it being like everyone assembles in the city and they fire lasers at each other. Instead, it was kind mm. of. Okay, well, we've got to distract this to do this to do this, and then you know all the all the pieces fell into place, and it didn't, never felt like super conceited. You know how often it'll be like, oh, the airships, the, the, we got to crash two airships into another, the and then Iron, the Captain yeah. America's got to jump. They literally I had Iron. the batteries from the beginning of the film. Yeah, and the the batteries were the uh, Chekhov's gun, but they were also the inciting hook of the whole thing, which yeah. was a really clever way to deal with that. So instead of like normally what you do, which is you have something happen and then you you're like, oh, we better, you know, in the first one, um, Rocket mentioned he's got like a gun that has like one shot. That's like a, it's, it's like it's, it can kill anything, right? In the first film, and that's the Chekhov's gun at the start, literally a gun, which is kind of hilarious. <laughs> um, and then at the end, that's you know they he uses it, it doesn't save the day. Yeah. yeah. Whereas in this one, it was like the batteries that he stole that caused all of the mayhem, helped him solve it, which I thought was kind of a neat way to deal with that. Well, it yeah. was it was also like weirdly consistent where. If you if you go like step by step through the decisions that all of the characters make, they're all based on the batteries. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like the decision for the um, like the decision for the the what are they called the renegades the Ooh. ravages ravages, ravages. Yeah. the decision for like them to stage the mutiny was because uh, blue dude was like Yondu Yondu he was like we're gonna take the batteries instead like we're not gonna yep. take them yeah. back. And, and then, like, that caused, that started the chain events. But still, you have the whole bloody yellow people. Ooh. Uh, 
Let's continue. <laughs> you have the yellow people. The golden boys. Gold. Yeah, the golden. The well, they're gold. all girls. Aren't um, they? The golden, golden girls. girls. Yeah. Oh no, there was a lot of. There was some boys. There were some boys. I remember um, they had a high priestess, but I don't remember what they were called anymore. They were like the so, the S- sovereign. Celeste, Celeste. sovereign. Sovereign. The sovereign. Yeah. Well done. Good recall. Nice, thanks. Nice like, that you were paying attention to yeah. something for once. <laughs> <laughs> but like their whole like thing was just. We just want the batteries back, and then eventually they. And then they're they, like, "No, we want to like, kill yeah, we all kill of them." The guardians, which was a bit. And then they were like, "We're gonna make Adam," which is weird. So the ending so what credits. Is... So Adam is a dude that can shrink anything to any size, which sounds like it's not useful. I thought it was like I thought when they when they revealed it that looked like a um, it looked kind of like the uh the super soldier generator thing that Captain America was put into. Similar, well, and I thought it was like a thing where they were just like, "Oh, did, are they making like let's juice one up?" Like, <laughs> yeah, they. I I was expecting her I to mean, say like, "We're is, gonna make super soldiers." People, but uh, it is sort of that sort of from what she was saying. It's just like super, like yeah, uh, I don't super know. Race of them. It seems like what they're doing now is they're taking, and I kind of like this about the adaptations that Marvel are doing. Is they're taking a lot of the source material. And rather than just straight adapting, they're like, "How do we make this fit into this world we've built?" And yeah. so there was there was a Ravenger. Ra- Ravenger, who Ravager. had who had Ravager, Ravenger. Is there Ravager. I think they're Ravagers. Ravagers. There was a Ravager who had magic from Doctor Strange in one of those in in one of the scenes toward the end. You know, you know, and they're sort of they're teaming up or whatever. She does magical symbols and she has magic. Oh. Wait, who? One of the one of the Ravagers in in one of the ending sequences when they've kind of ganged the, together. That, that group of Ravagers. Yeah, and she the does the two Sylvester the two Stallone magic. Oh, yeah. glorious leader. Which shows us that the magic exists in space, which tells us two things at once a the sorcerer supreme on earth from doctor strange are just one sect of the sorcerer supreme that exists overall oh, God damn so it. we might get adam <laughs> at some point because we saw his cocoon in um uh guardians one in the collector's um thing so it, i don't know they're doing these really cool things where they're trying to tie threads throughout the universe that aren't too obtuse that show you that they've thought things through mm. like how are the duck in that bar scene Fucking! Am- I oh lost my god! I, I was like, yeah. it's Howard the fucking duck. The I what? Am- Howard the duck? Howard the duck? Oh yeah, the duck. Yeah. yeah, he's at the end. He's in the ending credits of Guardians One. Yeah, and they're just dropping him I in. Had- no idea give they would me, actually bring him back. Give me a fucking, then, give me a, give me a fucking Rocket Raccoon <laughs> and Howard the Duck, the duck. Buddy Cop oh film. Oh so god. bad, oh so bad. Oh no! And like, fuck Howard like, the Duck's a good character. No, and like thirty-year-old Groot. What thirteen year old? You mean thirty year old? No, like what? Like uh, like on the edge oh, like, of like midlife crisis. Oh like. my god, that'd be so good. Oh, no. Groot, and he's driving the spaceship. Like, Groot in, in in Guardians One. Groot's like how old's Groot? He's like pretty old. It's like I'm nodding. He's like a hundred. Yeah, he's like super old. That's well, like that's uh, it's such a he's weird. Been around forever. Well, he ages really fast. So yeah, the, he so does. the space yeah. between. So this was thirty two years later. From the first film, and Peter is thirty, I think, in the first or thirty-one. So this this follows on. This is only like a few months after the end of the first film, right? Yeah. So Groot's aged from a stump in a box to being a little guy, and then to basically being a toddler, to and then to being a teenager. Well, we don't know the gap in time between. Yeah, but Chris Pratt hasn't aged. Yeah, but he's just, oh, he's not a model. And we also and we also know that the Guardians films follow roughly the same timeline as when they're released. So in real time. It's only been like we know that Infinity War, when it comes out, will have been X many years in the Marvel universe after whatever films came before it. Right. So we know roughly like how long the timeline is because that's how long the they've done a clever thing where they know the actors are going to age. So they're like, mm. if it's been it three years in real life, Chris Pratt's going to age three years, so he's yeah. going to be three years older, kind of thing, which is kind of clever. Right. Yeah. But I would, if they did one of these every like mm. three or four years, I would keep watching them. I mean, I mm. wouldn't stop watching them. Oh yeah, it's Guardians of the Galaxy. It's, it's just, I don't know. It's just it's oh, just fun. Good. It was just fun and like, okay, can oh. we talk about Gamora's fucking badass gunslinger outfit that she fucking rocks now? Can we talk about the fact where she fucking like lost planeted the goddamn like fucking machine gun, just oh picked my it God. up. She's insanely strong. Like, I didn't been, get that. She's from been the lifting first, like goddamn. The first movie, but holy shit, yeah, she's she got She just abs. picks it up. I was she's, like, um, oh. She's, yeah, she's a uh, like fucking. She's, she's an alien mm. race, dude. Like goddamn, like she's fucking uh, hacker strong. Like, I mean, Earth defense I, I, I sort of shit. picked it up when when she's keeping Drax like with them. That's a good point. You know, it's yeah, yeah, well, true. yeah she's pretty. Yeah, she's when the spaceship's buff, falling, yeah. that's probably a good indicator. I was like, that's she's... a lot of tension. Yeah. And then the best part about the... okay, so a few things before we get into they do a lot of screaming. Her and Nebula. <laughs> well, that, you know, they're, they're a rough it's just classical sisterly sister, 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 love. Um, 
I thought what was kind of cool, I don't know if I loved it throughout, but the the way that they kind of took Gamora from the first film and they made her more into, she's very much more similar to the character in the comics in some ways. Like mm. she's kind of changed a bit from the first one where she's sort of, she's the voice of reason. Whereas Peter's like, you know, do whatever. Let's have a good the time. The wild gunslinger. Woo, he's the wild yeah. card. Where she's the one that's like, why, you know, Drax is like going to jump inside it. She's like, what are you, that's insane. And then he does it. <laughs> and they have, there's that great bit of banter at the start where Peter's like, the skin on the outside is the same thickness as the inside. And she's like, don't you think I know that? Like, yeah. oh, that's such a good interaction. That's like uh, classic Guardians. Yeah. And that scene where they're on, uh, at the start, um, when they're protecting those batteries, that I think is a callback to, there's a, uh, there's a comic recently, well, relatively recently, where the Guardians break up mm. and they sort of go their separate ways for various reasons. And it's an almost identical platform to that where that happens. And it's one of those small things where like, clearly James Gunn looked at the iconography in the comics and was like, that one. And I don't know. It's just kind of like a cool touch <laughs> that like, it was very reminiscent of also, that stuff. Also, can we talk about how, if you, if you guys watch the pre thing that we did uh these guys wanted uh <laughs> shirtless, shirtless chris, pratt. chris pratt and we got almost it in like the first yeah, 15 instantly. minutes it was great what was really was cool is happy. that they hung a lampshade on it too because like gamora looked at him and was like really like yeah. i thought that was kind of nice <laughs> he um he looked fucking good and i loved his sideburns i loved his his little mustache yeah, yeah his, his little, little like, facial hair like <laughs> slightly <laughs> dirty facial hair yeah <laughs> i really suits him i think the i think my favorite part of the film was where he just like went it's it's this characterization thing you get it a lot in films but like there's two types of characters right there's like well no there's there's two ways a character will react to like shocking news there's like the character that will be like oh no it's so bad oh it's horrible and like it, all the music will get really sad and it'll be like long slow-mo shots and then there's the character that just pulls out both of their guns <laughs> and just shoots the guy in front of them and just oh shoots all of their bullets oh, oh, it's it like i'm so, so good. i'm so glad that's the thing how cool are the elemental guns in this film oh Fuck, my god I love yeah because i know the guns look so cool in this one well, they, they were, they're like they're much longer um and they shoot yeah, much like, they shoot, like little, little weird beamy instead things. of blobs <laughs> But they, yeah. Yeah, they still the kind of shoot time. like blobs, but like... They're well, they're, like, it's the same it's, mechanic. It's just he's... They're more like long... They're more like revolvers rather than I just, I just I just thought that scene was like, oh, it's happening. But I, <laughs> that was like the greatest thing because it was like, um, yeah, not only is it showing the father figure being really evil and like it, it didn't feel like it came I th- completely I thought the Yeah, well, you, was, like, you expect Peter to have respond to but situations But at the same like time, that. he's totally a mama's boy. Oh, yeah. Oh, but there I mean, is. Oh, they did. They did some stuff in that film that is like the, the scene where you, you saw like a snippet of it where they're lying in the field listening to the Walkman. Yeah. Yeah. That shit hit me hard because that's from the, that's like one of the OG the, comics. Oh, you my know, God. Like, yeah. And it's also in the game that Telltale just put out. Right. And like everything about that, I was like, oh, no, I'm having an emotion. <laughs> and then I was like, I'm just going to keep having feeling an stuff response. the more this film goes on. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Kurt Russell did an amazing job as Ego the Living Planet. Oh, he's amazing. Did this, you guys yeah. know he was a living planet before going in? Uh, no. No. Because the minute no. the minute I saw Kurt Russell, I was like, he's Ego the Living Planet. Like, <laughs> they're going to put a goatee on a planet. <laughs> like, I knew I was like, this is going to happen. They're gonna and put they Kurt... did the shot with his face on the planet. Yeah, the yeah. Kurt Russell. I was yeah. like, what? That was that, pretty cool. So did you guys see that? Te- did you see that coming? That telegraph that he was the planet? Um, I mean, he did say that he created the planet and like, I did sort of pick up on the fact that he sort of really belonged to the like planet. Like when it started from the, the whole- fact that like he built it around himself yeah. and that he needed to come back there so that the planet would stay alive. I mean, when, when it was just a case of when it was just like, I started off and it was just like his brain. I was just like, like well, oh, he's the planet. He's like, yeah, it was like, yeah, yeah. okay. He started off. But up until brain. that point, there was, you, you didn't. No, up until that point. Oh, that's so cool. I thought it was just I, like I, he just owned a planet. That's awesome. Because like I was like, well, because I, I knew uh, immediately the minute that I saw him, I was like, right, oh, okay, cool. It's Ego Living Planet. Um, they've never had him. Well, he's been. Well, is Ego actually is Ego actually his father? Well, in the comics, it depends on the version you look at. Right. Um, not all. Usually not. So because th- like my th- first thought was just like, well, if he's on the planet that he created, he could have just been like f- sort of temporarily bestowing the power of the light onto uh, him it's a bit to of a sort trick. of like trick him because oh, it was just like, cool. like i don't know hey, yeah I th- no I th- he, I think he confirms in, it yeah in this continuity he definitely he is, is yeah but in the comics it's sometimes nova who's like the guy who yeah. started the nova Corps. there's a few different versions of it mm. but i thought this was cool because it it did that really clever thing where it gave someone that you know is special powers 
and then immediately for, took them away. But for a really good reason. Yeah. And then he did something with them, and then they, and then and got rid of for them. a good reason and the same reason he got them, they yeah. went away. And I thought yeah. that was a really neat way of being like, yeah, when they when they oh, sort remember, of, remember original Star Lord who kind of had some powers. Well, this is kind yeah. of our homage to that. Yeah, when know? when they um, kind of revealed that he was like super powerful, I was just like, oh no, like I don't want him to be an actual god. But no. then it, then they kind no. of dialed it back. You yeah, know, and it was kind of it's kind of nice. Yeah. So I know you were you were saying in the car that you had something to say about the whole um, father figure turns out to be evil thing. Yeah, so I I did mention that that was an interesting way to deal with that trope because. One of the things that is really hard as a screenwriter and particularly like any narrative is like you want to have that betrayal feel inevitable but happen in an unexpected way, right? right. So like uh, a good example is like any story where you kind of when the when the twist happens you go, "Ah, oh, of course, what else could it have been?" but you don't really see it coming. Mm. Yeah. So it's a surprise, but it's an inevitable surprise because all the pieces line up to make it that. I thought they did a really good really really good job of that because he drops hints throughout where he's like you know, he kind of like shit talks Gamora a tiny bit too much. Mm. Um, uh, some of the stuff he says kind of telegraphs a bit of his intentions. And then you get the girl who kind of slowly reveals. And then you've got Gamora who's acting as the person interrogating that world. And it just kind of felt like they didn't do it too. That it wasn't like overwrought. Well, the second they went down that hole, I'm like, they're going to find some shit down there. Yeah. And that was cool. I, I, f- right? I found the, um, the, when he's like showing the timeline, the whole it was like the 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 sort of images, I guess, or whatever models of like him just like macking out with just various aliens. I thought was just the creepiest <laughs> oh, shit man. ever. I was it like, was that's bad. that's nasty, dude. Must- You'll have all kinds of like space diseases, <laughs> space STIs. Yeah, that's why he looks. That's why that's why he looks like Kurt Russell now. He used to be real handsome, and then he just fucked a lot of aliens. It's just, I mean, I mean, he used to look like bloody fucking Hasselhoff. So How'd I mean. you feel about uh, young CGI Kurt Russell at the start? I thought it was. Did you know he was CGI immediately or not? Oh, instantaneously! I was just like, "That's that's a young." Did Kurt you know Russell. it was Kurt Russell? Yeah, I, I, was, I yeah, instantaneously I was just like, "That's young Kurt Russell." It took me a few that's... minutes. It was the hair that, that chipped it the off. Hair was like, I don't really know very much who Kurt I've Russell is. I've seen a lot uh, of Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell's films. been a long, around well, for no, a long. Well, no, because I've seen because I've lo- I've watched a lot of Kurt Russell films where he's actually young. Yes. Oh, okay. So it's the of... Robert Downey Jr. problem where you've seen him. If you're like if the young CGI Charlie Sheen now, because you've seen him in like young Charlie Sheen in everything. Yeah, like you'd be like, oh, it's weird. Yeah. 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 Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I I guess it wasn't as bad for me because I don't really like. Ferris Bueller's Day Off, not Breakfast Club. (laughs) You're wrong one. Well, that's good then. See, that's interesting to me because that means that when you go into films, you don't get like stuck with. The same bullshit that we do. Where I'm like, like that, yeah. I'm like, Still oh, Kurt Russell's Russell. being. I, like, I knew Kurt Russell was cast in this film, and I'm like, oh, he's definitely ego. Who else could it be? That goatee, because I know that the planet in the comics has a goatee. Right. That's yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I, can't, I, I thought that, I thought they dealt with that very well. Like, it didn't feel insane that, that he was a planet. I mean, I, don't know. I thought it was. I thought there was jank going on because of the weird flower thing that he planted. Yeah, yeah, I thought that, that was gonna be like. Gave things I thought he was gonna quick. be like when they were macking out over it, which like poop, poop sh- you know, shoot up his seat into it, like literally. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I, not to be crude, but that's what I thought the implication well, no, was. He has a start. penis. They made well, that yeah, very realized, clear in the well, film. I that out when they got yeah, to they the planet. A, they did a joke about it. Yeah. and then Kurt Russell talked up his own dick. Yeah, which, oh, you got to you got to respect a man who does that. A bit odd. Uh, yeah, I thought that was a wi- you know what that it was, was an fun. odd joke. Yeah, that was a joke that went a little bit too long. But I think it worked. It, I think it characterized Kurt Russell like as you know his his version of ego. I thought it characterized that pretty strongly because he's a person who spends all of this time alone, and the time he does spend with someone, it's with an empath who is basically like Stockholm syndrome. So I thought it was kind of like, of course he's going to respond to that because he doesn't really have like social conventions down pat because yeah. he's fucked so many aliens that he's kind of like. <laughs> You know what I mean? I don't know. I uh, thought that was interesting. And then the the moment when the the reveal that he put the tumor in her brain, oh. the fucking cinema lost their mind. Yeah. Oh, I didn't yeah. see that coming. I was like, what are you? <gasps> I thought that maybe him fucking her gave her, you know, how like like in a like a um <laughs> Space Doctor AIDS. Manhattan kind of like <laughs> oh, if you yeah. fuck someone who's like magic, you get like you get, yeah, you get cancer. Yeah. Spider Man had that one time where right. his spider semen got Mary Jane cancer. <laughs> oh. What? What the? <laughs> fuck? I'm not kidding. It's like radioactive sperm. Yeah, well, because you got bitten by a radioactive spider. It gets you knocked the fuck up. It kill. It kills her. Uh, it's <laughs> right. a fucking sad comic. That um, sucks. It's like I just wanted to. Well, come it starts inside. off with like a sad middle-aged Spider-Man. <laughs> you don't know what's wrong, and he's like real having a hard time of it. Oh no! And all his villains are like trying to kill him, but they're geriatrics. So we can't really beat them up. And then it ends with him going to Mary Jane's grave, and they reveal that his spider semen killed her. <laughs> oh, Not important. No. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, it's not reveal. important. Uh, but what, I, I don't know what point. Oh yeah. So I thought I thought the implication was that maybe Kurt Russell he would uh, uh, have sex with these aliens. They would birth his child, and then but hey, having sex with him as a god would give them like cancer or something. Yeah. I thought that was the implication. No, but no. No, it was he literally put it like in. he was like, I don't want to be distracted. Time to kill a motherfucker. Like I had, I, like that was I see cold. the motivation and I see like how that works in this character. But as holy fuck. shit, that I, was like yeah. probably like, was if there was ever a way to make a character instantly evil, that was it. It's yeah, it's kill dogs, be a Nazi, and put a tumor and, in, and put a tumor put in, in Star Lord's mom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Peter but mom. I thought, I thought, uh, I don't want to be oh, that guy, man. but I thought that you know, it, it's one of the things that they always say on movie maintenance, um, which is that every villain thinks they're the hero of their own story. Right, and I think that that was why that's why Kurt Russell's character works so well. That's why ego works so well. Is that he genuinely thought that that was his purpose in life? Yeah. And yeah. so when he put that tumor in Peter Quill's mother, what he was saying was, "Well, this is the sacrifice that I have to make so that I can fulfill the thing that yeah, I, think I have he, to do." Yeah, he had that that line where he's Which like, is, if, I, "If I went back for the fourth time, oh, he, he I would have stayed." And uh, you know, shit's I had tragic. To, it's just that oh. that annoyed me so much. I was like, "You." Because then you empathize and you're like, God damn it. Yeah. Because you expect him to be like, I never loved your mother. But of course he's like, look, I honestly, I I couldn't have, if I went back, I would have, and then I couldn't have done this. So you're I had like, to kill her. And there's, munch. There's, <gasps> and then and then you get, and then there's a beat where they let you sit on it. Like, yeah. that, it was so well directed. You get you get this oh, moment yeah. to sit on it. You get to see sort of, you know, him Peter Quill slowly of, react. Yeah. And, and then eyes. it snap and then just oh, bang, bang, yeah. bang. And that. That beat, that it, pause. Oh. It interested me that they did the thing with his eyes where they go all starry and that signifies that he's sort of under the guy's control. I thought that was him. I, I, I thought that was Ego. Um, like showing him stuff, maybe? Yeah. I, yeah, I, something like that. But like, but it did feel like that trope where it's like someone's eyes go black because they're evil. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. felt a bit like that. It did but literally start off at the same time, like, that. It, yeah. it's sort of the the stand-in for in cinema you can't really show people's thoughts and like it is really hard yeah so instead eyes because the eyes are the doorway to the soul windows fuck yeah. that windows um doorway you can't open an eye <laughs> just, just crack it open have a look <laughs> inside grab a scalpel you'll be fine just uh get the key and just <laughs> hello know. is anyone home hello um, hello no but uh, you're right i thought that was a really good way to convey that without it being too like it wasn't too you know how like in the third Spider-Man film, when I mean his, Peter, the gets, act, Peter yeah. gets evil, and then oh, like God. they try and they try and make him evil the by being venom. a dick to the hot girl across the like way that what? is always nice to him, and you're like, why? <laughs> you're like, why? I don't get it. And then uh, whereas in this, it was much yeah, I thought it was a much more subtle way of conveying that internal monologue. I mean, his acting did get did get a bit hammy when he had the glossy eyes. Um, uh, I th- well, I he's think that's just because yeah. he, he acts a lot with like Chris Pratt's a very much an Wait, eye actor. He's so charming. He does a lot up yeah. here. So when the when the direction is keep your eyes put open, these, put these green <laughs> keep your eyes on. open and like yeah. just glare around. It's I, like he loses all of his acting to, ability. They were like, oh, right. now now move around jerkily because you're not yourself. And it's like, mm. yeah, yeah. I think it probably dirty. hit the nail on the head. That was a bit. Um, it was a bit. It was a bit weird looking. Like it didn't look yeah. authentic. Which is ironic, given like the some of the CG scenes in this. They should have like, just given more body direction, like make him like fall onto his knees or something, and be like, oh, and start like kind of like cowering almost. That would yeah, been, that would have like, been really kinda, interesting. And maybe don't even do the eye thing. Yeah, but I thought, okay, can we talk about? There was some action scenes in this that like I thought were fucking breathtaking from like a direction perspective. The scene where Yondu is going through the Ravenger ship and killing everyone, mm. and you f- and like, that was awesome. Just, but oh, that yeah, wasn't just... as good as the first scene with the eye dart when he um uh when it's when when so there's like there's like two sections. So there's when they break out and then he does the and right. there's a scene where like it goes dark and oh god no. he does it. The arrow zips around. I, I was like, Whoa. man, that was so nice. Oh, I just, there were so many scenes in this where I was just mesmerized by how beautifully directed. There was some a shots. A lot of that's entirely CGI with like mostly practical effects on the ground. Well, it was, yeah. Oh, man. There were like some shots that were like legitimately just like, you're like, huh. Like when Gamora is kind of, when she's off on the, um, on the planet where she's just like sitting alone before she gets attacked by a Fucking nebula. Hell. Like that, like the color scheme and like the vibrance and like the cinematography, it, nothing, everything about that scene was just like perfect. No, nothing else, nothing else has ever looked like this film does. No. And like there were moments in this where I just was like, how do they do that? 
Oh, it's the 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 um the sequence at the start with the credit sequence. Oh my god! Where you've got the battle going on, and they it did this. So good. They did this clever thing where you would get snippets of stuff in focus in the background. Yeah. That put you like it gave you like a sense of the location, but yeah. it was never too much, and you got the action. I was like, who? who th- where did James Gunn come up with that? <laughs> like it's just <laughs> baby Groot just well, dancing. Yeah. No. Oh, just like, so oh. good. That that intro for me was like the the moment where it's just like, yeah, I'm on board. Oh, it was my, was it like, was my yes. I'm on board moment. And then he smashed the speakers I, and I was like, on. Oh. And then, and then, and when then he, baby well, he broke angry. there was there was a fourth wall break there as well, where he like bounces off the camera. That's there's, amazing. There's, there's like a little oh, really? bit. I didn't notice that. Yeah, where he bounces off the camera. Um, there was like a slight fourth wall break. I, love I was that. I was wondering if they were going to acknowledge it, where like what? if Groot would like look at the camera, but like he bounces off the camera. Amazing. Fuck, I was I, just like, oh, sl- subtle fourth wall break. The the music in this. So okay, I'll say this: they did a really good job of not. You know, how in the first film, the music was like the hero. Right. They mm. did a really good job in this of making it feel organic and part of the story. Right. Because they knew that none. They they knew that. No, you can. No one can ever do Guardians again. The you, first yeah. one. Yeah, you can't no can, pull off the intro scene to Guardians One again because that was the legendary. The first time you see that, I wish, I wish I could see that again for the first time. Oh, because yeah. the first time that that it goes from black and it cuts and the music hits and you get Peter Quill dancing through that oh, like man. That was that was that's the a, that that's, was the only introduction you needed to that film, and you were just like, yeah, I'm. He kicks. Yeah. He picks up the thing and he sings into he it, sings and then into he kicks it, it. Oh, man, it was and then so the good. the title credits play. Oh, the, the 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 title card comes up. That scene, no, no one can ever do anything like that again because no one's ever done anything like that in a film. Yeah. This, as a sequel, did a really good good thing with a lot of the mechanics and a lot of the yeah. The places. music was just yeah. sort of part of it. Um, it felt organic and it wasn't like oh we've only got one mixtape. It was like we've got and they sort of played around with the volume as well. Where like during the particularly I noticed this during the action scene with Rocket Raccoon fighting the Ravagers. Yeah. Um where the music would sort of it would swell um at certain points when he was like doing action Mm -hmm. things yeah and then it would like recede back into the background a bit actually yeah that was pretty cool you know what the coolest thing about the music is and this is more of a characterization thing in the first film all of the music was just this weird stuff that quill would listen to one mixtape but in this one Every single character. Oh, listens they're to all the music. listening to it. Like yeah. Rocket listens it's to like it. Real life. Like yeah, yeah. like they're it's all like real even life. even like the uh, that mecha- that Ravager mechanic guy who runs away. Oh, uh, he's from he's from Gilmore Girls. Yeah, like he's even like, he's, even he's, he's, he's uh, listening to like shit. What's his name in Gilmore Girls? <sighs> I don't know what his name in this. In this but even he's worst. listening to it. Like it's this weird thing yeah. where like. It's almost like because everyone knows that Star Lord has like saved the galaxy, and he's like, "Yeah, I listen to everyone this music. To everyone awesome listens to eighties and seventies. Everyone music. listens to seventies oh, and eighties so music." Oh, the um, uh, what was what was the thing that he got at the end? Was it a zine or a zune? Or it was a, a zune, zune, which I think I, is the funniest the fucking funniest game. reference. Because it because those a, things are complete garbage. No one uses because it's always an I mean, iPad. So obsolete. It's always an iPad in the comments. For him. Mm-hmm. For him, Such it's like joke. so new, but for us, it's like okay. Yeah, for it's us, so it's like good. the zoom. Also, <laughs> fuck them for using that song in that scene, and what? then you get the funeral. The fuck, I don't know what that song is. What? Uh, it's Father and Son by Cat Stevens. Fuck them. That, that I, song is I teared the so painful. fuck up. They started yeah. playing that, and it got you know that like small part of your chest where there's like the, that little like empty literally space? the moment I saw because I I listened to a lot of Cat Stevens as a kid because mm. my dad is yeah. like one of those people right and like the moment like it came up and I was like oh no oh no it's this song I was like oh it's gonna happen <laughs> it just, and then it gets and then it keeps getting more and more emotional and then you get that awesome scene where you think Gamora is gonna say something to Peter but she goes to her sister and I was like yes and then <laughs> they have that great scene where there's no resolution that's yeah. a really clever thing about the ending of this film you get these nice little dovetails but there's no like overarching resolution you know Gamora still wants to kill Thanos she can't do it by herself we know that you but mean she's- Nebula you mean Nebula Oh, shit. I don't know any of the names of the characters. Nebula still wants to kill Thanos. And Gamora goes up, you know, you have that nice interaction where Gamora kind of puts herself on the line and she's like, look, I was as scared as you were. I just never really thought about what that was going to mean for you. And that was a nice way of showing Gamora's growth from the start of the film where she kind of realizes that maybe her pe- her feelings for Peter aren't a problem. Yeah. And that maybe she can be a sister and this person involved in the world. And hopefully if we get a Guardians 3 or they're in Infinity War, what we'll see is a team who's together and not like that tension's kind of going to kind of fall to the wayside because Rocket's kind of on board. Um, Yonder's, Yonder's death was like, that was tough. Oh, that man. was painful. Because you get the, 
because you have the Kurt Russell, Ego the Living Planet thing as his real father. But of course, it was, you know, it was Yondu the course, whole time. Yondu, Yondu the entire Yondu time. And you get Yondu Dad, redeeming yeah. himself at the last second, but then the sacrifice isn't noble because you don't want him to die because uh. he's so awesome and cool and such a good uh. person. And then he's dead, and then they make it worse by doing that fucking funeral scene. No, the Ravager funeral. And I was like, Eyeballs. I was like, what's going to happen? What are they going to do? And then they do fireworks, and I fucking cried. <laughs> yeah. I fucking. You claimed at the beginning of this that you didn't cry, but. They so they're they're standing on the deck, right? So that this is I'll tell you exactly what went through my mind. So they're sitting <laughs> yeah. on the deck, yeah. uh, and they're looking out, uh, and and the, all the ships are coming in, and then you know the guy does a little cheer, and there's a moment where Gamora's like, you know, they they look at each other, Peter and Gamora look at each other, and I was like, oh shit, okay, and then they have that little nice little moment. They don't ruin it by having them kiss, yeah, and then they kind of put their arms around each other, and then the fireworks keep happening, and I was like, oh, that's the I guess that's me, and I just <laughs> sat and I just cried a bit because. Fuck this! I don't know what it was. Maybe it's the pacing. Maybe it was a narrative structure. But that's that's how you end a sequel to one of the best and most creative films of all time. That's how you end that, right? Like yeah. you, t- you take this thing that no one's ever done and you make a sequel that looks like nothing anyone's ever done with an insane premise and an insane cast. The thing is, like it ended, and I was like, I my 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 feels are just destroyed, and I. How can you end it like this? But at the same time, I'm like, this was perfect. And again, it's 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 exactly what what we were talking about before. It's 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 inevitable, but it's a surprise. You know, it's surprising, mm. but it's 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 yeah. it, it couldn't have ended any other way. And that is such a great way to you know when Rocket gives he's like I've got the one spacesuit, I've got the one rocket pack. Yeah. And you're like, what is what? Like, why, why why is that I a no problem? No idea. What, I was like, what? and then the minute that um. Uh, Yondu sweeps in and saves him. You're like, oh yeah. shit! Mm. This is like, and oh. it just because in the his his okay little MacGuffin talk in the first film, Peter Quill always has his rocket shoes on. In this film, he didn't because the ending sequence would have been ruined if he had them on. Yeah. Well, he was using the rocket pack. But why? I get, yeah, I know. But like, yeah. but it doesn't. I, I know I that mean, they if, got rid if, they got rid of them for that reason, so that that ending sequence has. If he had tension. them, he could have just. That's the reason why and they the thing destroyed is he, his he uh, his mask. Yeah, yeah, they 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 destroyed that, and he gave his rocket pack to Drax because Drax didn't wear it, which they established earlier on. Because of the nipples. Had his nip nips. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, how cool is the tech in these fucking films? With oh the my god! Tap it and so just they ha- keep getting. Oh fuck! It's cool. Although, I, yeah, I don't know. I just felt like he should have had the rocket shoes, and they could have. Just and destroyed them with the mask, with the rebreather. Or like done. when he when he's punching on with old mate, he could have. I don't know. He just felt like we didn't get it. Like I don't know. That's just not an iconic yeah, Star Wars thing. thing. The thing about that as well is that like they didn't really. You can't. You have to convey that the other characters know that he that his tech is broken. There. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, th- yeah, yeah. I didn't really thought of that because they know that he because gave the pack to Drax. If they don't know that his tech's broken, they can't save him. Yeah, but there's an eloquent solution to that somewhere in that. Like, so something you talk about in writing a lot is escalation, right? So, like, if you then said, "Well, Peter's shoes are broken. No one knows that they're broken. He can't rock it out of there. How is he going to get out of it?" Like, then it's up to the writer to be like, "Now I painted my character into the deepest well of possible." Like the deepest pit possible how's he gonna get out and writers come up with that shit at like 3 a.m in the middle of the night when they're taking a shit like i'm not even kidding like and and like you know that you've stumbled into a shit at 3 a.m good question but you you never had diarrhea um (laughs) no uh like that's how you know you've got a good story is when you've written your characters into such a deep hole that you're like how am i gonna get them out of this talent in being a writer comes from writing somebody out of that corner without bringing in deus ex machina correct and 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 then and then what you do when you've done that is you go back through the story and you seed that solution. So in this case, it's the batteries at the start that cause the whole story that end up destroying you go the living planet. And then of course it's um, Yondu uh, taking that mission in the first place that ends up saving Peter in the end. But that only happens because what you end up realizing is that all of this shit is interconnected and that actually Kurt Russell's yeah Kurt Russell's actions of killing all of those kids and all of those people and aliens were actually the reason that Peter Quill was saved. But they're also the reason he was there in the first place. I don't know. It's, it's just so clear. It's all, it's so well done. Yeah. They painted him out of that corner so well, but there's just no reason for him not to have the rocket shoes on. Cause it was such an integral part of the first yeah. one. I don't know. It's just, that was an odd choice. I don't know. Um, 
um, another note. Um, one thing I was just thinking is that you know I didn't realize how Ego's name was spelt until they actually put it up on the screen. I, yeah, was I didn't like, realize oh, it ego was actually as, Ego. As yeah. Turns, okay, yeah, yeah, that kind yeah. of Ego. I thought the name cards were pretty good because they weren't obnoxious. Well, they were better than fucking Civil War. Literally, where they were, like the whole film. thing and like oh, God, Open yeah. Sans font bold. <laughs> Um, comic sans <laughs> yeah fucking, i've become yeah. such a fun nerd um no i thought they were good and i you know it it gave you enough sense of place that and, th- and that's when his name really started to seem wanky by the way uh well when you figure out what type of ego we're talking they, they did a clever job of hanging a lampshade on it by having everyone being like that's a fucking dumb name <laughs> instead of you being like wait ego the f-? see i knew it was ego the living planet the minute i heard ego so i was like oh of course but like the minute that everyone's like ego's a dumb name i'm like oh, he's gonna be a planet later um, <laughs> it's even more ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, uh, f- uh, closing thoughts, final emotions, feelings. It was good. Yeah, I had a right. I don't know. I you know what I'm like for a good. I'm a sucker for a good story. I, I think was, for me, it was it was the kind of thing where it was like because it wasn't the first. Like I don't from a film perspective, it is yeah, it's as good as the first one. From like a cultural it didn't perspective, shock you like the first one. Yeah, it didn't just like come out of nowhere and just be like this is what Guardians of the Galaxy is. Yeah, but, but they didn't have to do that, though. They just had to give us a good experience. Yeah, I, see, good. I see what you're saying, though. Nothing, it's like no one, no one's ever going to do the Dark Knight again. Yeah. No one exactly. can, because it's been done. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. But I thought as far as sequels go, for a film that was really groundbreaking, I thought it was a perfect yeah. sequel. Yeah, it didn't retrace too many steps, which yeah. was good. No, that's a, I think well, it's probably... Well, apart from, you know, they save the galaxy again. Which that is a running trope. In the, that is a running Guardians trope, of trope the in the galaxy. Yeah. But the best part of that is they always do it by fucking accident. They're like, oh, <laughs> shit, we have to save the galaxy again. Yeah. Fucking it's like, hell. oh, we're in this situation uh, where we have to save the galaxy. Yeah, okay, it's I guess great. we'll do that. And yeah. we'll get paid, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know. I, oh, I want to see it again. Um, I had such a good time, but I don't want to have so many emotions again, so I don't know. I have to space right. it out. Uh, but as always, it's that time of the week, Ben. Where can people find us? Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, t- 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 um, Instagram. Yep. Patreon. Patreon. Yeah, uh, so thanks as always to our two top patrons at the moment. So we've got Jordan and Anonymous are still our top two. Uh, if Anonymous, send me a message on Patreon. We want we should chat. Um, I don't know who you are, so you actually have to send David me a message. David wants to know your name. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I want to chat. Right. Anonymously. Uh, and this episode is always brought to you by DigitalOcean. They're an amazing uh, web hosting service. Fucking nailed it that time. Now I've ruined it. Uh, if you go to dcm.work slash ocean, you get $10 of credit on us. They're super easy to use. You can set up like a server in about 60, well, they say 90 seconds. It took me a little bit less than that. Uh, if I can use them, anyone can. I'm an idiot. Um, they have great deals. They have great customer service. They send me really nice emails as well, which yeah, I've mentioned nice. several times. They send me nice like, uh, we've noticed that your traffic's higher than usual. Did you? Is that intentional? Or are you getting like bot attacked or DDoS or something? And I'm like, no, we just have a successful podcast. That's all. <laughs> That's you guys out there. Uh, but yeah, so check them out, dcm.work slash ocean. You get $10 of credit. It's about two months worth of hosting. They're an awesome service. We use them to host the podcast. And if you do that, it helps us out, helps out the show, helps you out. It's all good. Everyone holds hands. And as always, I'm at DCM. I hate pie. Not literally, Ben. Okay. Not literally. <laughs> I'm at Lily of Citrus. That's what you do to Twitter handle, Laura. Oh, that's at how that Laura ends. Ducky and we hang on. Let's see if the cat's still awake. I wanna. I'm gonna say, oh, oh. Is the cat gonna say something? Nope. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know if that'll show up. The cat was here the whole time for yeah. audio listeners. Don't know if If you want to see the cat's head periodically, just go to youtube.com <laughs> slash DCMworks and we'll see you guys next time. Keep uh keep on keep, keeping on. Keep Yep, that one. I'm gonna go to the bathroom. Again. Yeah. Work the seal. Yeah, that's what happens when you're diabetic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, really, <laughs> I, I don't know if that's how that works, to be honest. I have no idea how diabetes works. I assume it's bad. No, I, I meant... I meant... Oh. <laughs> Laura, I am not a man of science.